All right. All right, perfect. We'll go ahead and jump into questions for associate head coach Mike Schwartz. We'll start with Grant Ramey, then Vince. Mike, obviously Alabama shot it really well from the three-point line. It looked like Arkansas was getting to the rim early Wednesday night. What have the defensive breakdowns been the last couple of games that you've seen? Well, we've, we come in, we really knew that these two teams, uh, a little bit like St. Joe's was, really wanted to play either behind the three-point line or right at the rim. Uh, not as much mid-range, not as much post. And most of the teams we've played haven't been exactly that. And it all starts with guarding the ball, Grant, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, we haven't done a great job over the last two games guarding the ball. Uh, give them credit. Uh, they, they were able to get to the paint. And as you start to really be concerned with that three-point line, what happens is the defense starts spreading out. And, and our defense, as much as we want to pressure the ball and do that, is really predicated on guys helping and five guys moving as one. And what's happened over the last two games, and as we've broken it down on film and talked to the guys about, is we've got into this, you're on an island mentality. Uh, you guard your guy. i got to make sure my guy doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And we've stopped helping each other and moving cohesively a little bit over the last two games. But again, two really talented teams, good offensive teams, Arkansas and Alabama. And they were able to, uh, to get to the paint. And once they start getting to the paint and getting us in rotations, and we've talked about that a lot, uh, they were able to shoot the ball from behind the arc much better than teams have up to that point. Thanks, Mike. Michael, good to see you. Give us a little example of something behind the scenes of – Jaden Springer's basketball IQ, some things that maybe he recognizes on the court, uh, perhaps uh, even beyond his years. Well, we start with this, you know, coming in, people were probably questioning what kind of shooter is Jaden Springer? Uh, you know, is he a great three point shooter? And so this would be the ultimate telltale of someone who's really got a high IQ. He's shooting, leading our team three point percentage because he takes great shots. And one of the hardest things for any freshman and, and sometimes any aggressive basketball player, particularly on offense, is to understand shot selection. And if you look at the shots that Jaden Springer takes as a freshman, he takes his time. He's got rhythm and tempo when he shoots the ball from behind the arc. And he knows how to get where he wants in the paint. He's developed a really physical driving game. He almost plays the guard spot like a post player. He knows where he wants to get on the floor. He uses his shot in the mid-range. But the biggest thing would say, uh, Vince, is that his shot selection from behind the arc has allowed him to shoot such a uh, high percentage. And that's really impressive for a freshman, especially when you consider that people were questioning what kind of three-point shooter really is he or they wanted to see. And he's proven it, but it's a lot of it's because of his shot selection. Mike Wilson and Jimmy Himes. Yeah, Mike, um... South Carolina had to cancel their game Saturday. Do you have any indication of if that could trickle into your game Tuesday? And and if you do have an SEC game postponed, do you just expect to use that as practice time, or would you ever consider filling that with another game? Don't don't know. Uh, don't have an idea about Tuesday yet. Uh, as far as what that would entail next week, meaning Tuesday, I think that's more up to the conference uh, in terms of what they would do. So we, that's just a wait and see. And, and right now, you know, obviously you just hope everybody's good at South Carolina. That's most important. Uh, you feel for them in terms of some of the situations they've had in terms of the shutdowns they've had. They've had it really difficult in December and uh, they played fantastic the other night. And you could see the excitement of their players uh, in their game versus Texas A&M. So, no, it's a wait and see. And we, we just got all, all hands on deck for A&M tomorrow. Mike, um, what does it say about Keon Johnson that going to the foul line late in the game, he's shooting less than 60%, yet he knocks down six out of six in the last 146? It says a lot, Jimmy, and, and that's a great point uh, because that's something that coach has been on him about, whether it's shooting the ball from behind the arc, whether it's free throws. But here's what it also says is that he spent a lot of time in the gym, uh, like all our guys do, but he really has. And he's dedicated himself and he understands sometimes the hardest thing in getting better is when you can't look in the mirror and say, I need to be better here. And that says a lot about Keon, a maturity standpoint that he knows I need to become a better shooter. I need to become a better free throw shooter. He's such a dynamic driver. He gets fouled a lot. And, and that was really impressive the way he closed out that game. He wanted the ball and he wanted to be at the free throw line. And, you know, that's a great momentum builder for him, but uh, really it says that he's, been putting the work in and he understands where he wants to be better and he's 
very coachable in that standpoint. Also, Mike, against Arkansas, you had a combined 19 steals and blocks. Arkansas had a combined four. How important is that stat to you? Really important. And we talked about it. To be honest, we felt like defensively, Arkansas may have been the worst we've played all season. And the only thing defensively and probably on that side of the ball with what was able to help us win the game, because our offense, guys making shots and guys making plays and making free throws is what, in the end, we were able to come out with the victory. But from a defensive standpoint, you've heard us allude to it all the time. Coach Barnes talks about it. Fix it plays. And in that game, those statistics that you referenced, forcing 20 turnovers, nine blocks, 10 steals, that was the difference on the defensive side. That was the one area defensively that we were able to execute and do what we feel like we should be attempting to do every night. So that, that area, we also had 29 deflections in that game, which is a statistic that we actively track and really put a lot of emphasis on. So the fix-it plays, the plays where guys were making up deficits, making up areas where, talking to Grant, we really didn't do our job schematically, those plays – were really big for us and really was the only highlight of our defense that night. To build on that, Jimmy, Tennessee has forced eight of nine opponents to turn it over on 20% or more of their possessions. We'll go next to Ben McKee and Vince Ferrara. Coach, how would you assess the play of Santiago these first two conference games? Seems like he's gotten off to a, to a slow start. And if that is the case, uh, what has your message been to him as, as y'all looked at Texas A&M tomorrow? Well, you, you got to think, Ben, that Santi's really one year into his career. So he is really like the beginning because obviously he only got half a season last year. So this is his second round in conference. Uh, it's his basically one year in again. So the message has been this. As we get into conference, and we've talked to the whole team about this, and it's not just Santiago that's going to deal with this. Scouting goes to a whole nother level right now. These players, these coaches – they know what we're trying to do on offense. They know what we're trying to do on defense. We know what they're trying to do on offense. We know what they're trying to do on defense. So you really have to understand that. that that's a big deal. And now this is the second time, third time around, teams have played against Santiago. They know, they've watched film on him from the preseason. So they're doing things like trying to keep him on his right hand. They understand what a dynamic shooter he is. They understand areas where, hey, these are areas we could maybe – make it a little bit more difficult for him. So it's, it's no different than any player, but for Santiago, it's been this. Stay in the gym, continue to work on your right hand, continue to work on being a dynamic shooter, and understand that teams are going to try and expose all our weaknesses. It doesn't matter if it's individually or team. And it, it, back to the question we were talking about, Keon, what, what Jimmy talked about, he's able to look in the mirror and say, I know I need to be better here. Teams are going to pressure me. Teams are going to sit on my left hand and, and, and not let me get to it. So that's it. it. It's nothing to be concerned about, but it's something you have to hit head on. And, and he's, he's working at it every day. And, and he'll improve. He'll continue to improve. And he'll get back in rhythm in terms of that. But that, it, it's normal uh, what, what he's going through. Michael, I know the focus is on the players, not on you guys, and it, but it, it looks like it's a little bit more challenging for you guys as a staff with the setup of the bench and the way everybody is spread out. Can you give us a, a few thoughts on what that has been like to experience that layout with this year's circumstances and trying to do everything you need to do? Yeah, Vince, the first three things that came to my mind as, as you were asking that question were this. Num number one is the masks. Uh, you know, obviously communication during a game is, is paramount uh, between the bench, between the, the bench to the court, whatever it may be. So those masks put a little bit of a challenge and, you know, you're trying to do the right thing. And, and I think our staff, we pay attention to it. We don't want to be pulling our masks down. So you're trying to communicate with the mask. And believe it or not, sometimes you're talking to guys and, and you're in the huddle and you're talking at a, at a fairly normal voice and they can't hear you, but they also can't read your lips. And, and being able, so that, that's probably the first thing that I've thought of. You're talking to guys and reading lips, you, you'd be shocked watching film, talking to each other in high intensity environments reading lips and things like that become a big deal because you just know facial expressions, whether the guy gets it, doesn't. So the mask sometimes I think makes it a little bit harder for the players as well as us communicating with them while they're on the court. That'd be number one. Number two would be for the coaches to talk to each other. The space is okay. No, no big deal. We, we can get up and move around. But the other day, I remember during the game, wanted to go down and talk to one of our guys 
and it felt different. You got up, you leave the action, you go down to the end of the bench, or you go down to maybe in the in the in the in the, the stanchion over there where the, where the where the stands are, and you're talking to the guys there, and that's a little different, you know. I mean, but it's what it is, and and uh, you know we're fortunate to be playing, but probably the communication aspect with the masks is probably the biggest challenge, but it, it's nothing big. But that's what I was thinking of as you asked that. Mike Wilson and Kelly Stitz. Mike, the other day, Rick said that that he's really starting to to see Josiah become the voice of this team. Um, when did you guys start to to see him emerge as that, and how does that show itself um, in how Josiah really handles himself with his teammates? Yeah, this is a great point. Uh, you started to see it some last year when he first arrived on campus, and, and and I think that's a confidence he has about himself, and he's a team first player. So he was always deflecting to other guys. He was always, in, in terms of anything that was coming his way, credit-wise, or anything he was doing well, it was always deflected off to his teammates. And he did that as a freshman. He did that in high school. He's always been that guy. He's always been someone that, I think that pass-first mentality, you, you earn a lot of kudos with your players when you're like that. The guys know that he's not out there thinking score, 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 to the point where Coach Barnes, our staff, his own teammates are telling him, Joe, you need to think about scoring more. We need you to do it. It makes us better. So that's one thing. Probably the other thing, which is the biggest thing, and we've talked about it as a team, when we go in the film room and we go in areas where we're on the court and it's getting intense or, or coaches getting on guys and we as a staff are getting on guys, whether it's on the court or in the film room, Josiah unequivocally always takes it on himself. Now, that, that was me, coach. I should have done that. Well, and, 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 you know, and we know sometimes it's not him, but he's got this element of really looking around and knowing who might be a little bit down, who might be struggling physically, mentally in the film room, maybe going through it. And he finds a way to, to put it on himself. And, and that, that's a very strong quality. Uh, Grant Williams did it uh, at a very high level while he was here. Coach Barnes has had great players in the past, did it. TJ Ford did it for him. When we were at Texas, he was like that. And, and it's really a confidence thing and, and, and an ability to help your teammates. And the guys know one thing about Josiah, he is all about his teammates. Hey, Coach Schwartz, after watching some film on Texas A&M, what are your expectations for the game on Saturday? Absolute physical um, a game that's going to be determined in the paint. Uh, that's, that's probably the best way to say it. Uh, they want to keep teams out of the paint, and they're a very good rebounding team. We want to get to the paint, and we want to be a great rebounding team. And if you look at last year, uh, they shot just over 30% from the floor, and they beat us 63 to 58, and we shot in the 40, uh, somewhere in the 40% range, uh, maybe mid-40s. But it all came down to one thing. They had 23 offensive rebounds. So it's going to be an extremely physical, hard-nosed game. They're a great, well-coached team that, again, puts a huge emphasis on playing hard, playing physical, rebounding. And they absolutely came in our building last year and got the better of us in all those areas. And, that, and, that's, why they, and that's why they won. And then um, a quick follow-up, going back to Josiah Jordan-James. Um, we learned that his house in South Carolina, um, unfortunately, was destroyed in a fire. Um, what do you have – how did you guys support him and what does that say for him to be able to play through a tough time um, about his character and him as a player as well? Yeah. You know, it's like we were just speaking about him. I mean, really high character uh, Kelly in terms of who he is as a person. Um, the stuff we were just talking about him really speaks to his mental toughness that he can handle it uh, because you, you know, you guys know that, that there's going to be a very high expectation on the court in the film room here uh, from coach Barnes and, and sometimes guys get it good. And for him to be able to take that on and, and, and take more of it because he's got it about as hard as anybody in, in terms of what the expectation and standard is for him. So to be able to deal with something personal like that and to continue doing what he's doing, yeah, it absolutely says a lot about him and, and a lot about his family. His, his family uh, didn't tell him right away. Uh, they waited, they wanted to get through a couple games. And once we got through the Alabama game, you know, they, he, he found out about it and it was difficult. It was difficult, uh, but it says a lot about him. And, and Josiah's just done a really good job saying, how can I help other guys? And 
you know what, this would definitely be an area where he could put himself first and say, you know, I had a tragedy at home and, and it's personal for him. And he has not alluded to that at all. And he's continued to try and help the young guys. He helps the guys on the court with what we're trying to execute because again, he really understands what we're trying to do on both sides of the ball. And then he understands the intangibles when guys may be struggling emotionally or mentally, he tries to help them in that area too, all while going through something like you alluded to. So uh, yeah, says, says, says volumes about him. Jimmy, then Brent Hubs. Mike, uh, you were asking about Santiago Vescovi a little bit earlier, and I just wonder if late in the game against uh, your most recent game, you you wanted to get the ball to him to go to the free throw line. And I just wonder if, if he's one for 15 from the field, does it really matter? Do you have that much confidence in him when he goes to the foul line? He will come through. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And uh, again, it goes back to what we were talking about. What he's going through, uh, teams really trying to uh, focus in on areas where they can make it difficult for him. It's no different than we're going to try and do tomorrow night to Texas A&M players. Texas A&M is going to try and do it to him and our whole team again. It, you, you could go down the line. And, and th this is what uh, sports is this time of year. It's what college basketball is in terms of conference scouting. But from a standpoint of who Santiago is, the confidence we have in him, his ability to make big plays, make big shots, make the right decisions, or in your example, make free throws, 100% confidence. And we were glad he was at the line. And also, um, I think this is still accurate. I think SEC teams have won like 50% of their games on the road. And Vince asked you a little bit about the bench situation that you had. Do you think a part of that is um, – the lack of home crowd and other extenuating circumstances that have led to, to visiting teams winning at that high percentage? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I would absolutely think so. I mean, you can never underestimate the, what a, what a home court and what a crowd is. I mean, we have the best one in the country and when Thompson bowling is going like it is and, and it would have been this year, there's no better place to be playing. And so, yeah, you, you can't even come close to trying to fathom the, the impact that that is no crowd, uh, the momentum. Momentum is such a big thing in sports, and, and it just takes a, a sh out at Thompson Bowling has won us many games because of that. And so it, it's just not there this year, and I think there's a lot of great venues and fan bases in the SEC. It's the best conference in the country in terms of passion and fan bases. And so, yeah, I, I believe that is the exact reason why. Coach, two questions. One, how would you rate this team's physicality, knowing the, the challenge that you have with Texas A&M coming up uh, on the, tomorrow? And two, you spoke earlier about the, the fix-it element to the defense, the fix-it plays you had. Is, is, do you worry at any point in time that a team can become too dependent um, on fix-it plays defensively in terms of their fundamentals or maybe their lack of fundamentals because they feel comfortable with the fix-it plays around them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I don't know if you worry about him becoming complacent, but you, you can get overconfident in those plays. And you can sometimes in, in a physical game or a game where fatigue is setting in, some of those things can slip because you know you might have an Eve Pons coming over uh, to change a shot at the rim. And so maybe instead of your first three steps in transition being as hard as they need to be, you're going to react and know, hey, I got someone on the back line that's going to help me. So, yeah, you know, you definitely and we talk about it. We talk we can't rely on that. That's got to be an element that's always there with the front line of our defense doing what it needs to do. And over the last two games, uh, to your point, it hasn't been there. But I don't think that's at all the reason why I would say give credit to Arkansas and Alabama. Number one. Number two, our rotation has been a little shorter these last two games, and that's normal. We're here in conference play now, the Missouri game. We are able to win uh, with a little bit of a cushion, and now you get into your first real possession game of the year against Alabama, the rotation shrinks a little bit. This is normal, and it will build back up, but our depth has not been a factor over the last two games. So that's also a reason, and that goes back to your first point. Up until the last two games, we've been a really physical team, and – We've lost a little bit of our physicality the last two games. But again, I'm going to keep giving credit to Alabama and Arkansas. They play a five-out game. They space the floor. They make it a little bit more difficult to be physical, if you think about it. They don't have someone 
always in the paint area. So they got the floor spaced out. So when it's like that, there's going to be a little bit of less of a physicality to our game. So again, they had a, they did a great job. We're fortunate that we were able to, to, to win the Arkansas game, but we do want to get back to being a really, really physical defensive team. And, um, you know, our rotation and depth is a big piece of it. And we haven't had that quite as much the last two games. So I would think that would be the reason why more than anything, not any complacency on, on what our schemes or anything like that are. Mike Wilson and Jimmy Himes. Yeah, Mike, I don't know if you guys have had a full-fledged practice since um, since Wednesday, but how, how's Jaden looking with the ankle? How's he moving around? Um, an expectation he's closer back to 100% on Saturday? Well, you know the saying, Mike, that I don't know who is 100%, any of us, coaches or players. So, no, he's fine. His, he was. We have not been back on the court, but have full expectation he'll be a full go today at practice uh, when we're done here. Mike, uh, do you think that Victor Bailey does as good a job as anybody on the team of hunting his shot? Probably because he's really an offensive-minded, aggressive player, and we love that. Um, I mean, you're always searching for the perfect balance. You're always searching for someone who, who's really aggressive but knows exactly when to pass and when it's not a good shot, but I'm not sure that exists. Uh, you know, J J Josiah – we want to be more aggressive and he overpasses VJ. Maybe sometimes we say VJ this is the time you could have passed it, but in the end of the day, in a, an athletic fast paced league, like the sec, uh, uh, Victor Bailey is someone that could easily be the type of player that we were facing against Arkansas or Alabama. That really puts a lot of fear in your defense because he is so aggressive. He shoots the ball. Well, he drives the ball. Well, he attacks the basket. So, he, he is a prototypical, dynamic, offensive SEC guard. And so I think as coaches, and Coach Barnes would be the first to say, I mean, you're, you, when you're watching film or during the game, you're always going to say, well, you could have done this or could have done that. But his errors might side on, on, on the area of aggression, and some other players might side on the area of being a little more conservative. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's VJ Bailey. He's a scorer. He's an offensive player that knows he wants to be better on defense. He wants to understand uh, shot selection a little bit better, understand when he can create for his teammates because he's got that ability. But, uh, you know, that, that he's learning that and he's going through that. But, yeah, that's a – I don't know if I want to say hunt his shot, like you said, but he's definitely an offensive-minded player that is wired to score. And that's not a bad thing at all. Do you want your inside players to be wired that way as well? I think, I think John Fulkerson is, I mean, I think John Fulkerson is wired to score. I mean, he waits to get that ball and he knows what he wants to do when he gets it. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a different game for post players. Post players really have to depend on guards, getting them the ball or, or being in a position in a much smaller area of space to go to work. So I think John is, I think Eve is developing his niche and his game, what he does in the post. Uh, I don't think we're worried at all about Olivier or Urosh or EJ thinking that way. They, they got to do other things to get themselves on the court, which they are very capable of doing. When they have the opportunities to score, we want them to finish and take advantage of, of shots that we know they're capable of making that come within the offense, shots that they work on in practice. But we don't need a bunch of guys thinking being wired to score. One other thing, is there any update on Corey Walker, his progress? Working every day in practice, getting better. We'll take one last call for questions. Look, All right. Go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, I was gonna, you said working every day. Is he cleared to play, Walker? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Tip off tomorrow is 2 p.m. Eastern. Right. Thanks, guys. Good to see you.